Hello, my amazing children. This is Grandma Carla, and we are back with Ralph S. Mouse. We are on Chapter 3, Irwin J. Sneed Elementary School. As Ryan hopped down the steps of the school bus, Ralph poked his nose out of his pocket and found himself in a crowd of children, all of them bundled up in hoods and parkas or jackets and knit caps. Clouds of vapor came from their mouths as they shouted back and forth to one another. A tiny cloud formed in front of Ralph's nose, too. A boy jumped out of a yellow tow truck and shouted, So long, Dad! Then, as the truck pulled away, he added, So long, Arfy, to the dog sitting next to the driver. Arf! answered the dog, who looked like a kindly wolf. That boy must be Brad, thought Ralph, as the children trampled snow on the back playground on their way into the long one-story building that was Irwin J. Sneed Elementary School. Inside the building, the linoleum-floored hall, unlike the halls of the Mountain View Inn, was a broad, smooth highway with no rough carpets to wear down the already thin tires of a little motorcycle. Ralph wondered how he would endure the whole day of waiting for night to come so he could race down that long hall. There would be no furniture to get in his way and no little relatives to make him feel guilty for not sharing his motorcycle. That hall was the perfect race course Ralph had dreamed about ever since he had ever owned the motorcycle. With no one around to see him take spills, he could even rear back on one wheel to practice wheelies. Ryan entered room five, a room different from any room Ralph had ever seen. Unlike the rooms at the inn, this one was furnished with many chairs and tables instead of beds. At the front, seated at a desk, was a woman Ralph knew must be Miss Kay. Her toothpaste was nowhere in sight. At the rear of the room, Ryan hung his backpack on a hook. Then he removed his parka and hung it on the hook, too. Hey, don't leave me here all by myself, squeaked Ralph, alarmed at being alone in such a strange place. Take me with you. Promise you'll stay out of sight, whispered Ryan out of the corner of his mouth. Sure, agreed Ralph. Ryan started to poke Ralph into the pocket of his jeans until Ralph objected. Hey, not here. This place is too tight. You'll squash me when you sit down. Sorry, said Ryan, and he dropped Ralph into the breast pocket of his plaid flannel, flannel shirt. No sooner had Ryan sat down at the table than he and the rest of the room five stood up again to recite some words about a flag and something about liberty and justice for all. Whatever it was, Ralph hoped mice were included. Ryan sat down and began to shuffle books and papers while Miss Kay talked about numbers. Ralph tried to listen above the steady lub-dub, lub-dub of Ryan's heart, but soon he grew bored. Ryan's shirt was new and the flannel still fuzzy. Ralph nipped a hole in the front of the pocket for a better view and then lulled by the muffled lub-dub, lub-dub, and the steady rise and the fall of Ryan's chest, fell asleep as if he were being rocked in a cradle. Because a heart does not strike the hours like a clock, Ralph slept until recess, and again until lunchtime, when Ryan remembered to slip a bit of sandwich into the pocket for his lunch. Sometime in the afternoon, Ralph awoke feeling hot, cramped and restless. Maybe no one would notice if a small brown mouse poked his nose out for a breath of air. After a few whiffs, Ralph stuck his head all the way out to see what was going on. All heads except one were bent over papers on the tables. One girl was chewing on her pencil and staring into space. That's funny, thought Ralph. I didn't know people nod things too. Unexpectedly, the girl turned her head and looked straight at Ralph. Then she tapped another girl on the shoulder and pointed. Too late, Ralph ducked back into the pocket. He heard the girls whispering, and soon others were whispering too. Uh-oh, thought Ralph, feeling both guilty and doomed. 
he had broken his promise to stay out of sight, he was in trouble. Miss K spoke. Melissa, is something disturbing you? She asked. Melissa, thought Ralph. So that's the girl whose boot I'm supposed to live in. Not exactly, Miss K, answered Miss Melissa. There seems to be something going on that I don't know about, persisted Miss K. Won't somebody let me in on it? I, uh, I thought I saw something move in Ryan's pocket, admitted Melissa. Ryan, do you have something you wish to share with the class? asked Miss K. Ralph squeezed himself into a corner of the pocket as Ryan's heart began to beat faster, or rev up, as, Ryan, as Ralph thought of it. No, not exactly, Ryan told his teacher. The class began to speak. Yes, he does. He does, too. I saw something, and it moved. Ralph dug his claws into the flannel shirt as Miss K said, Ryan, why don't you come to the front of the room and let us see what it is? Ralph started to chew through the side of the pocket closest to the heartbeat. As Ryan walked to the front of the room, he reached into his pocket, grasped Ralph by the tail, and dragged him, clawing and struggling, out of the pocket. Ralph was so angry at this treatment he was squeakless. When Ryan set him on the palm of his hand, he turned his back to the class and sat quivering with rage and terror. What a beautiful mouse, said Miss K, who was young and enthusiastic and eager to give her pupils learning experiences. Class, gather around for a better look. I'm beautiful, thought Ralph. No adult or child, for that matter, had ever described him as beautiful. Far from it. Look at his perfect little paws, said Miss K. Ralph looked, too, as the Klaus class left their seats to crowd around. His paws looked like ordinary mouse paws to him, but now that she mentioned it, maybe. And his lovely little ears, continued Miss K. Ah, oh, breathed the children. He's cute. He's really neat. He's darling. Well, what do you know? Ralph perked up and stopped quaking. Shyly, he turned his face to the class. One member of Room 5, however, did not admire Ralph. He's just your standard old brown mouse, said Brad. There are plenty more like him. Where did you get your mouse, Ryan? asked Miss K. At the hotel where I live, explained Ryan. He's a very smart mouse. His name is Ralph. What's his last name, someone asked. Mouse, answered Ryan. His name is Ralph S. Mouse. The S stands for smart. May I hold Ralph? asked Miss K, and Ralph found himself transferred to a softer, cleaner hand. He stood up and began to groom his whiskers, always a good performance. He could see that Ryan was happy to be receiving so much attention from his classmates. Ah, breathed the class again. Look at him. He washes like a little cat. Such a tiny little scrap of life, said Miss K. He's a little miracle. Ralph stopped wiping his paws over his whiskers to look with love at Ryan's teacher. Her long, shiny hair fell over her shoulders. It looked so strong that Ralph was sure that just one of her hairs would be perfect for tying his exhaust pipes in place. Perhaps the custodian has a cage we could keep him in, said Miss K., Love turned to distrust. This wonderful woman with useful hair was turning out to be like any other grown-up. Ryan spoke up. I don't think Ralph would be happy in a cage, he told his teacher. I'll just keep him in my pocket if it's all right with you. Good old Ryan. Miss K gently handed Ralph back to Ryan, who stuffed him in his shirt pocket. Thank you for sharing, Ralph, she said, above the lub-dub of Ryan's heart now steady as a well-oiled motor. Class, how would you like to draw a picture, pictures and write stories and poems about mice? Friday afternoon, we could have a mouse exhibit to show off our work. Ryan, you could bring Ralph to school again so he could be our guest of honor. Miss K, who had no idea that Ralph was planning to live at school, was a teacher who could turn anything into a project.
Most of the class was enthusiastic. Others thought mice were as good a subject as any to be drawing and writing. A boy named Gordon said he didn't like to do any of those things. Miss K suggested he could go to the library, look up facts about mice, and write an essay about them. And what do you want to do, Ryan? she asked. I would like to tell how smart Ralph is. Ryan's answer threw Ralph into a fright. What was Ryan going to tell his classmates about the motorcycle? Ralph would not ride his precious motorcycle in front of everyone. Splendid, Ryan, said Miss K. But why not show us how smart he is? Do you know what a maze is? Sort of, said Ryan. I've seen them on kids' pages in a Sunday paper. You take a pencil and you try to draw a line through open spaces of a diagram from one side to the other. It isn't easy because there are a lot of dead ends. That's right, said Miss K, who was drawing a maze on the blackboard as Ryan spoke. Scientists use mazes with walls to test the speed with which mice learn. They start a mouse at one end and time him to see how fast he reaches food at the other end. Then they have him do it again. If he cuts down his time, they know he has learned from the experiment. Do you, know, do you think you could build a maze? I'd like to try, Ryan answered. Good, said Miss K. I'll bring a stopwatch for timing Ralph's race through the maze. I can bring my cap pistol for a starter's gun, volunteered Brad, showing interest for the first time. Good idea, said Miss K. You like to build things, so perhaps you could help Ryan build his maze. The boys eyed one another as if they were not sure how a partnership would work out. Uh... Okay, agreed Brad. So it happened that Ralph was not only a learning experience for Room 5, he was to have a learning experience of his own. He was not sure he liked the idea, especially that part about the starter's gun. What if he couldn't run through the maze faster the second time? What if he couldn't find the food the first time? What if he turned out to be stupid? Of course, I'm not stupid, thought Ralph, as he tried to make himself comfortable in Ryan's pocket once more. I can ride a motorcycle, can I? He began to have doubts again, and doubt turned to anger. His intelligence, or stupidity, was nobody's business but his own. When the last bell rang and Ryan went to the back of the room to collect his parka, Ralph poked his nose out of the shirt pocket. I'm not going to do it, he squeaked at Ryan. I'm not going to run any maze just because you say so. Sure you are, said Ryan, out of the corner of his mouth, so no one would notice he was talking to Ralph. I'm new in this school, and nobody paid any attention to me until I pulled you out of my pocket. You have to run the race. Ralph became stubborn. No, I don't, he contradicted, and you can't make me. Ryan ignored this remark. Do you want me to change you do you want to change your mind about staying here? You can go back to the inn with me. I'll stay here, answered Ralph, thinking about that long haul waiting for his motorcycle. I can't let Matt lose his job. Ryan looked around to make sure no one was watching before lifting Ralph out of his pocket and placing him in an overturned boot. So long. See you tomorrow, he said. Who are you talking to, a boy asked. Me? Ryan was all innocence. Nobody. I'm just practicing to be a ventriloquist. I'm working up an act. Some act, remarked the boy. Ryan held up one hand and waggled his fingers as if he were working a puppet's mouth. What did one dandelion say to the other, dandelion, he asked in a squeaky voice without moving his lips. I don't know, he said in a normal voice. Then he answered in a squeaky voice. Take me to your weeder. All this nonsense made Ralph frantic. Hey, give me my motorcycle, he ordered, as soon as the other boy had gone. Ryan tried to speak without moving his lips. And have you riding all over school? Not a chance. You'd get lost or get into trouble or someone would see you. It's my motorcycle, squeaked Ralph at the top of his lungs. You give it to me now. Ryan was last to leave the room. We'll see about that, he said as he bent over to speak to Ralph, after you run the maze on Friday. 
With that ultimatum, he snatched his backpack off the hook and hurried away to catch the bus that would take him back up to the Mountain Top Hotel. Ralph was so angry, he sank his teeth into Melissa's boot. Ugh, it had a nasty taste, half rubber, half dust, and he had thought Ryan was his friend. Not anymore. He was mean. He wasn't fair. Ralph felt terrible, but he was not going to run that maze in front of room five. Ryan couldn't make him. Maybe he would even hide and refuse to be the guest of honor. Ryan would learn not to try to order him around. Ralph sat in Melissa's boot and sulked. Without his motorcycle, he felt mad at the whole world. Of course, he was a smart mouse. Why should he have to prove it? Ralph felt as if nothing was fair and nobody loved him. That is the end of chapter three. Let's look at our pictures. Okay, here is a picture of Ralph in Ryan's pocket. He's peeking out of the zipper, isn't he? Here is a picture of the classroom in room five. I'll show this picture first, and it looks like the girl, oh, here, they're just talking. I don't see anything particularly special in that picture. I think he was just saying that room five was unlike any room that he had ever been in, and I think it's just showing room five all around, okay? So then, here though, do you see Ralph peeking out of Ryan's pocket right there? And he was spotted, wasn't he? One of the girls saw it, and then she told another girl, and oh my goodness, the trouble started. But you got to remember, Ralph didn't keep his end of the bargain, didn't he? Did he? He went into the room, and here's a picture of the maze that the teacher drew on the board. So she's giving Ryan an example of what a maze is. And let's see. Oh. There goes Ryan. He's leaving to go home. And where does he leave Ralph? Inside an overturned boot. But no motorcycle. And Ralph's a little bit mad about that. Part of this problem was brought on by Ralph, wasn't it? Um, I think R Ralph needs to remember that Ryan's done him lots of favors, hasn't he? He's, he's forgetting that um, Ryan is giving him part of his lunch and taking care of him. He's kind of forgetting all the kind things that Ryan has done, hasn't he? Sometimes we do that, don't we? We forget the kind things when all of a sudden we get angry at somebody. We forget all the good things and we just focus on the bad things, and sometimes we sulk, too. Do you ever sulk? Sometimes Grandma Carla sulks, and it's not right, is it? All right, so tomorrow we're going to read more of Ralph S. Mouse. This is Grandma Carla, and I love you.